Hey everyone, Will here. So for today's video, we are going to be analyzing the Bay of Pigs invasion that took place right before the Cuban Missile Crisis. That means we're going to be going over all aspects of this event, including the details leading up to this event, the details during this event, and the details at the end of this event. So without further ado, let's begin. So the Bay of Pigs invasion was a failed military invasion into Cuba by Cuban exiles, coordinated by United States CIA operatives. The Bay of Pigs invasion itself took place between the dates of April 15th and April 20th in 1961. So the story behind the Bay of Pigs invasion all begins in the mid-18th century when Cuba was a member of the Spanish colonial empire. In the late 19th century, Cuban revolutionaries sought to give Cuba a national identity, thus leading to the start of three major wars in that time period. The Ten Years' War, the Little War, and the Cuban War of Independence. During all of this, the United States simultaneously declared war on Spain, thus starting the Spanish-American War. Overwhelmed, the Spanish army was quickly forced out of Cuba as U.S. forces entered Cuba. Once the Spanish-American War ended with an American victory, the U.S. government quickly coordinated efforts with Cubans and helped start the Republic of Cuba. Within no time at all, this republic quickly established Thomas Estrada, a Cuban-born U.S. citizen, as the president of Cuba. During this transfer of power, a large number of U.S. settlers and businessmen began to arrive in Cuba. By 1905, more than 60% of rural properties in Cuba were owned by North Americans. As this was happening, between 1906 and 1909, the U.S. military had stationed 5,000 U.S. Marines across Cuba, while the U.S. started making multiple internal affairs decisions at the behest of the Cuban government. At this time, with the support of the United States government, Cuban politician Fulgencio Batista oversaw a long line of puppet presidents whose only purpose was to disguise the power that Batista was accumulating. The U.S. ambassador to Cuba even told Fulgencio Batista that he was the only man in Cuba who held any form of personal authority. As Batista's power grew, a socialist named Antonio Guiteres began to speak out against Batista's rule over Cuba, and in 1935, he became the first of many of Batista's prominent political opponents to be murdered. It has been widely believed by historians that Guiteres' death was carried out by government gunmen. Shortly following this death, several of Batista's other political opponents began to simply disappear without a trace. Five years later, in 1940, Batista officially ran for president, supported by the Democratic Socialist Coalition, along with the Cuban Communist Party. While Batista was a capitalist, he had also supported strong labor laws and labor unions, which rallied both the Democratic Socialist Coalition, along with the Cuban Communist Party, to his side. With this support, Batista won the presidency and was elected president of Cuba. During Batista's first term as president, World War II broke out and Cuba officially joined the Allied powers on December 9, 1941, reinforcing Batista's support for the United States after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. Towards the end of Batista's first term as president, rumors of corruption poisoned Batista's political image, and as a result of this, Ramon Grau became elected president as Batista's first term ended. Shortly after Grau's presidential inauguration, Fulgencio Batista left Cuba to go back to one of his houses in the United States. 
frustrated with the direction of Cuba's new government, Batista came back to Cuba in 1952 and launched a military coup right before Cuba's 1952 presidential election. 17 days after Batista's revolution, the U.S. government officially recognized Batista's government as the government of Cuba. Within days, Batista canceled all future presidential elections, describing Cuba to be henceforth known as a disciplined democracy. Very quickly, however, many Cubans despised the idea of a one-man dictatorship. They feared U.S. involvement in Cuba's politics and the control U.S. businesses in Cuba were gaining over their economy. Many Cubans under the leadership of Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, and Che Guevara launched counter-revolutions. Between 1956 and 1959, Castro led guerrilla assaults from his base camp in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. Overwhelmed and incredibly unpopular, Batista had retreated from Cuba. Wielding complete control over Cuba, Fidel Castro handpicked Cuba's next president, Manuel Urrutia Leo, and denounced the need for future elections, citing his vision for Cuba as one of a direct democracy where Cubans could take their concerns directly to him. Many Cubans were not pleased by this decision. With the spread of the Soviet Union in the mid-20th century, the United States created the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA, to help snuff out communism before it could grow. The CIA took a particular interest in ending Castro's regime for two main reasons. Firstly, the CIA was created to stop the spread of communism, and Cuba was communist. Second, the U.S. had many business interests and assets located in Cuba. Because of this, U.S. officials were extremely displeased by Castro's decision to place all U.S. businesses and corporations under state-sanctioned control. Soon after, Castro opened talks with the Soviet Union and started nationalizing all U.S.-owned assets, such as banks and sugar mills. The United States CIA then contacted Cosa Nostra, an organized crime syndicate, to plan an assassination on Fidel Castro. In exchange for successfully assassinating Castro, the U.S. would install a pro-U.S. Cuban government while guaranteeing the Costa Nostra Mafia they would get a monopoly on gambling, drugs, and prostitution in Cuba. Tensions between the United States and Cuba grew even more when Fidel Castro started to establish diplomatic relations between Cuba and the Soviet Union. With Castro nationalizing oil companies in Cuba to refine oil specifically for the Soviet Union, the United States government became unified in their objective to overthrow Castro. On March 17, 1960, the CIA brought a new plan to U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. The plan had four main steps to aid the anti-communist movement in Cuba. Firstly, creating a well-funded propaganda campaign against Fidel Castro in Cuba. Secondly, establishing a covert U.S. intelligence network within Cuba. Thirdly, establishing U.S. paramilitary forces outside of Cuba. And finally, aiding a covert anti-communist Cuban militia operation. In order to begin preparations for this covert invasion, the CIA began to train anti-Castro Cuban exiles in Miami, Florida. Infantry training, aviation training, boat handling, and amphibious attack training were all taught to these recruits in secret CIA bases located on Yusepa Island and other various parts of southern Florida. On August 18, 1960, President Eisenhower had officially approved a $13 million budget for the secret operation. By October 31, 1960, guerrilla assaults directed by the CIA in Cuba had failed. Developments for an ambitious amphibious attack were underway as newly elected U.S. President John F. Kennedy sped up preparation efforts for the invasion. 
On January 28, 1961, President Kennedy was officially briefed on the latest iteration of the invasion plan, which was listed under the code name Operation Pluto. Operation Pluto planned to land a thousand Cuban exiles in Trinidad, Cuba, which was at the foothills of the Escambre Mountains. The benefits of Operation Pluto was that Trinidad was very close to counter-revolutionary activists, thus allowing the U.S. to hopefully have coordinated backup in their attack. It was also very close to the Escambre Mountains, which gave the Cuban exiles a designated escape route after carrying out their attack. The downsides to Operation Pluto was that the airfield perimeter was not large enough to fly in B-26 bomber planes, which were critical to destroying Castro's air force. Without an air force, Fidel Castro would be very vulnerable to attacks launched by counter-revolutionaries. President Kennedy's Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, proposed airdropping a bulldozer into Trinidad, Cuba to widen the airfield, but this idea was quickly rejected by Kennedy and other officials. President Kennedy finally came to the conclusion that Operation Pluto would be an ineffective strategy. In turn, President Kennedy signed a newly proposed plan, Operation Zapata, now called the Bay of Pigs Plan, into effect. The Bay of Pigs Plan, also known as Operation Zapata, was supported by President Kennedy primarily because it provided an ideal airfield for the B-26 bomber planes while also being less of a military-based attack, which would make official U.S. involvement seem less plausible to Cuba and the rest of the world. Many top aides to President Kennedy, including Secretary of State Dean Rusk, had concerns about the plan, but they kept their reservations to themselves. Many military leaders were also hesitant about launching this plan into action, but President Kennedy launched the attack regardless, feeling a need to fulfill his campaign promise of defeating Fidel Castro. In March of 1961, the CIA helped Cuban exiles in Miami, Florida create the Cuban Revolutionary Council, chaired by former Cuba Prime Minister José Miro Cardona. Cardona was supposed to lead Cuba after Cuban exiles, with help from the CIA, overthrew Castro's government. Anticipating an invasion, Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara stressed the importance of arming Cuban civilians with weapons and rallying them to Fidel Castro's cause, stating, All of the Cuban people must become a guerrilla army. Each and every Cuban must learn to handle, and if necessary use, firearms in defense of the nation. The first part of the plan was to paint over eight American B-26 bomber planes so they matched the appearance of Cuban planes. This was done to prevent Castro from knowing the invasion was staged by the United States. Unfortunately for the U.S., however, Fidel Castro and his revolutionaries had intel on the secret mission days before it happened, primarily due to their secret intelligence network, and information on the attack that had been leaked by U.S. newspapers as well as foreign newspapers. On April 15, 1961, a group of Cuban exiles took off in their planes from the ally country of Nicaragua, targeting Cuban airfields. Unfortunately for the Cuban exiles, however, Castro and his allies had anticipated the airstrike and had moved their military planes away from the airfield and out of harm's way. Then, on April 16, 1961, a small force of Cuban exiles were sent to Bahia Honda as a diversion force to distract the Cuban army, while on April 17, 1961, the Cuban Exile Brigade Unit, Brigade 2506, started their invasion on the Bay of Pigs, located on the southern part of the island. The CIA was anticipating the attack would take Castro and his allies by surprise, but a radio station located at the Bay of Pigs broadcasted every detail of the attack plan to Cubans listening all across the island. In turn, 
This led to the Cuban exiles being ambushed and the ships of the Cuban exiles being sabotaged by the Cuban Air Force that the CIA had hoped to have destroyed prior. This led to large amounts of ammunition and medical supplies to be lost at sea. Because of this, the small number of 1,511 Cuban exiles were quickly ambushed by 25,000 of Castro's soldiers, and within 24 hours, virtually all of the surviving Cuban exiles were captured. It was at this point in time that the United States' involvement in the Bay of Pigs invasion was publicly revealed before the entire world. Taking full responsibility for the loss, President Kennedy remarked in a famous press conference, There's an old saying that victory has a hundred fathers, and defeat is an orphan. Further statements, detailed discussions, are not to conceal responsibility because I'm the responsible officer of the government. After this attack, Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara also had some taunting words towards the United States and President Kennedy saying in a letter directed towards President Kennedy, Thanks for Playa Giron. Before the invasion, the revolution was weak. Now, it's stronger than ever. On December 21st, 1962, an agreement was signed for Cuba to exchange the now-imprisoned, surviving, Brigade 2506 veterans in exchange for 53 million U.S. dollars worth of food and medicine sourced from private donations and company donations. On December 29, 1962, President Kennedy hosted an honorary ceremony for returning Brigade 2506 veterans who were released from custody. Over time, the problems in Cuban-American relations led to both the U.S. creating a complete trade embargo on Cuba and the initiation of Operation Mongoose, another effort led by the CIA meant to eliminate Castro's regime. Eventually, this led to strengthened Cuban-Soviet relations that would cause the eventual Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Thank you for checking out our video. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more additional content. If you have any ideas for a future video topic, please leave a comment below and let me know what you would like to see me cover next. I'm really hoping to grow this channel and provide you all with more content in the future, and your support means the world to me. Thanks everyone.